A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to a special edition of True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Everyone in the world of true crime has a story to tell about a case they worked or they lived through. Some are high profile, some you've never heard of, but they are all fascinating. Today's case is about the violent murder of a retired teacher and artist in his home in the Silver Lake neighborhood of Los Angeles. Joseph Gatto was 78 when he was shot while sitting at his desk. And at the time of his murder, his son, Mike, was a lawmaker, an elected official working in the state capitol. One would think that someone in the system might have a better chance at getting justice, but he hasn't. Ten years later, the murder remains unsolved. His son, Mike Gatto, is our guest today. He's written a new book about his father's murder, Noir by Necessity, a true crime story about the underbelly of crime investigation in Los Angeles. Mike, welcome to the program. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I thank you so much for having me. First of all, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, there are no words that I have um, other than to say that all of us collectively are very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, I can't even imagine you getting that phone call. You were you were working that day. Yeah. So. Uh... I did something a little different when I was in the Capitol. It was sort of a political um, liability, but it was something that I did for my family. So the California legislature where I served is in session when the kids are in school. So roughly, you know, nine twelfths of the year, uh, we get a short break for summer, we get a short break for, for winter, but it's basically a full-time job. Now, most people leave their families home. Um, they leave them home in the district, but I moved my family up to Sacramento. Of course, I got some grief. They said, you know, you sold out or whatever. But um, my family was up there full time and I had business in the Capitol in November. And so, yeah, I was up in Sacramento when I received that call and I was home with my family, my two young daughters and my wife. And it was your sister, one of your sisters who found your father murdered. Correct. Um, We were, uh, you know, just wrapping up after dinner. We had put the baby to bed. Uh, we were playing around with my then two and a half year old uh, before she was going to go to bed. And I got a call from my sister. Now, she didn't, my little sister, she she didn't typically call me at like 730 on a weeknight. So I picked up the phone and uh, she was absolutely hysterical. And she said, you know, I went over to dad's house for dinner. Um, he hadn't been responding to phone calls and texts. And I found him slumped over. And I said, well, you know, I mean, the first thought that I had is no way, right? My dad was the healthiest guy on the planet. Uh, First of all, we had been tested genetically. We have the centenarian gene, right? And a lot of people in his hometown in Italy lived past 100. Um, He was in the peak I didn't know there was such a gene. (laughs) Oh, yeah, there is. There's several of them. And and I'm hoping I live to 120, but... But he was just in the peak of health. He was such a robust, healthy guy. Uh, my wife loves to tell a story about one time we needed a refrigerator. Um, ours had, had gone and uh, she she heard the doorbell ring and there he was holding a refrigerator. I mean, he was just he was someone who sprinted up the stairs in you know in his late 70s. He worked in his garden. He could deadlift trees. And so my first reaction was no way. Um, there's no way my father died. Um, and so I said to my sister, call the paramedics. I mean, like, don't just don't just sit there, call the paramedics. And she's like, well, you know, he's cold. And I said, well, still call the paramedics. And uh, she did. And, um, you know, I don't really remember what happened in the next hour or so. It was a whirlwind of calls and this and that. But at some point, someone, it was either the police or my sister or somebody else told me your father is dead and the likely cause of death is murder. So he was shot in the abdomen. Correct. Uh, you know, at the time, first of all, the, the Silver Lake area, um, the, the home was near the reservoir, his home, not yes. too far. Yeah. yeah. So this is a lovely area of Los Angeles. It's very special, kind of hidden away. It's not it's not the kind of neighborhood that gets a lot of tourists and stuff like that. It's really a, a true neighborhood. So I don't believe there had there hadn't been a murder in more than a year. So it's an unusual thing to have happen. At first, did they think that this was a break-in or what did they think happened? Well, it's fascinating because, uh, and one of the things I go into my book is that there have been so many theories. Some of them have been totally crazy and I'll share some of those with you. 
uh, some of them were logical at the time. The first theory that hit the mainstream media when my father's murder reached the mainstream media was that it had to do with his collection of rare Russian paintings. Uh, really? My father was an artist and he collected art. And there was a type of painting that he owned that are called icons. They, they, they're icons because they portray saints and they're often painted with gold and silver paint. Yes. Um, and they're very old. They're painted on wood and they date from like the 1600s. And my father had an extensive collection of these paintings. And right before his murder, there had been a, ve a very public announcement that Joe Gatto was going to attend the meeting of the Russian blah, blah, blah collectors. And he's going to bring his collection, some of his collection. And one of my neighbors had talked to the media and said, you know, we suspect this was the Russian mafia or something connected with, you know, Russian organized crime because it had publicized that his collection of icons was going to be with him. But the police quickly dispose of that theory because, you know, there were there were some hanging on the wall in his house and not not one of them was taken. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first fits and starts that we had with theories about my dad's case. And then there were um, so your dad was um, not only a, an art teacher and an artist himself, but um, he also helped to um, to to give birth, if you will, to a very special school in Los Angeles called the L.A. County High School for the Arts. And so yeah. um, this is a man who had more fans than I mean, he didn't have any enemies, did he? Precisely. So he was a very beloved f uh, figure in the community. Um, he was sort of like that old Italian man that gives everybody tomatoes and peaches and things like that. <laughs> when when we had his funeral, one of the most poignant moments was when I was giving the eulogy, I said, is there anybody here who my father has touched their life? The, 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 the whole church stood up. It was 1,200 people in a church that fits 300 people, and most of them were his students. He touched so many people's lives. He was such a beloved figure. Um, some of his students, I mean, you know, Ken Day Wiley was one of his main ment mentees, protégés. He went on to paint the, the White House portrait of Barack Obama. His pieces, his, um, his sculptures sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, he's probably the most, one of the most famous visual artists in the world today. Um, other of my father's students went on to design well-known cars. He taught celebrities, uh, singers. Um, he just was a really good guy, and he was a sort of a pillar of the community. So no known enemies. Um, he had some precious art. There, um, from what I read, I have not read your book, um, but from what I read in news articles, he was making jewelry at the time, and you believe that some of his pieces may have been stolen. They were rather unique. Sure, so yeah, my dad was, um, he was sort of like a starving artist. Uh, who put all of that aside, right? Like the generation now, if you wanna be an actor, if you wanna be a sculptor, you just do it, right? Damn the torpedoes. But my father's generation, it was different. He believed in duty. So he genuinely thought that his true calling was art. He loved to paint, he loved to make jewelry. And this wasn't, this wasn't diamond engagement jewelry. This was craft jewelry. Yeah, some was made with silver, some was made with gold, but these weren't extremely valuable pieces. He put off his entire career to raise us, worked three jobs, but then when he retired, he started making jewelry and his career was just taking off. He was like this recognized jeweler all of a sudden. But I want to stress his pieces were not, you know, platinum engagement rings with big diamonds. He made he made craft jewelry. And yes, the police believe that some of it was stolen. However, you know, they put out bulletins to pawn shops. They they've done everything they can to try to locate it. Not a single piece has been found. Oh, my goodness. You know, when we talk about cases like this, um, many times, I mean, 99% of the time, the victims, survivors, or the family of the victims, it's their first time ever dealing with anything like this, the justice system, the police. Obviously, it's the first time for your family dealing with it, but you are in such a unique position, Mike, just because you spent so much time with other lawmakers, with members of the Justice Department, with police departments and captains. And so, you know, we look at someone like you and think, wow, this is this is the kind of son who could call the local detectives um, on the case and get right to it. But none of that seems to have mattered. 
I have so many things to say, and I'll try to start with just a few of them. So, so yeah, I was an elected official at the time, and you cannot be an elected official in modern America without making some enemies. So right after we disposed of the Russian paintings theory, I thought this might be political. I thought I might be targeted. The police quickly dismissed that. I had made a few enemies, and there were a few people that I thought might have targeted my father because of it. But the police had a very haunting or chilling line with me at some point. They just cut me off at some point. They said, look, if these, you know, whoever killed your dad wanted to send a message to you, they would have killed you, Mike. And so the police never really gave that much credibility, the whole political angle. But then on the flip side, right, there is what you said, which is, you know, I think about all the victims out there who don't have a platform. I'm so fortunate, Anna. I have a Twitter following. I have my political career. I'm on TV twice a week. I think about all the victims out there who don't have a platform, who are desperate. They are begging for some attention for their cold cases. And it's hard to get. And as you said, it's hard for me to get answers. I worked very hard not to be that guy. I didn't want to be the guy pulling in, um, calling in favors or things like that. But I would attend speeches with the mayor of Los Angeles. And he was a friend of mine. And he would say, how are things going on your dad's case? And I would say, well, not so good, right? And then that would get to the chief of police. It would get to the detectives. I think the detectives hated me. I think <laughs> at some point they just hated me. and. Yet I worked so hard not to be that guy. I only responded to queries. I didn't do what a lot of victims' families do, which is hold a press conference on the steps of City Hall and say, they are not working as hard as they should be working, and they haven't done this and they haven't done that, which was all true. But I didn't do that. And Do you regret that? Do you wish that you had? I, I don't really. I mean, um, you know, it definitely caused some pain for me over the course of the investigation, and I think that perhaps it would have drawn some attention to certain things. But at the same time, if, if the people who are investigating your family victim's crime hate you, I don't think they're going to do a good job, right? And so that's that's what one of the things that I w wrestled with. And I know that they wrestled with this too. You know, there was a time where, where we offered a reward for my dad's case. There's a standard reward that the city of LA offers for all murders. And I said, hey, listen, I'm a powerful fundraiser. I can go out there and I could raise millions of dollars and I can make this reward 10 times as big and I'm willing to do that. And I'm willing to write a check myself. And they said, no. And I said, why? And they said, we cannot send a message that your father's killing meant more than others. And, and you know what, they were right. They were absolutely right on that account. My father, yes, he was connected to a famous person or whatever, but we can't send a message that one life means more than others. And if you offer a $50,000 reward in one case and a $5 million reward in another, it does send that message. So they were right on some things, but on other things, they were very wrong. And being in office made it all the more hard to, to you know, correct them on it. That's so interesting, Mike, because I would have thought the complete opposite, that I would have thought that your position as an elected official would have made it possible for you to cut through all of this, but instead it, it paralyzed you at moments because yeah. you couldn't be seen as that guy, as you said. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to politicize my father's killing, right? Uh, about a year after he was killed, I was approached by some very powerful people who said, we want you to appear with President Obama at a gun safety, you know, gun control rally or something. And I thought about it and I was very flattered and everything. And I'm sure this would have been wonders for my political career. But you know what, at the same time, I don't want to become a demagogue. I don't want to politicize things. And I just, it just didn't feel right for me. It just didn't feel right to be taking something so intimate and turning it into something political. So I tried to avoid it with all counts. You know, it turned into some very interesting things at times. I'll, I'll give you an example, um, you know, of something that I was a little bit upset with, with the police. We'll get into this later, but the police ended up coming up with a profile. They profiled who might have been one of the the types of people who killed my dad. They had all these various theories. For a long time, their main profile was that this was a neighborhood kid. This was some kid from the neighborhood, 19, maybe 22, something like that, who had killed my father. And they had a profile of this kid, kind of maybe high on drugs, maybe raised by his grandparents, all this thing. As you noted, my father's neighborhood is very small. There's a couple hundred houses and there's one high school. And so I said to him like, well, you got a profile, we have a sketch. Have you gotten the yearbooks from the high school? Have you? And they, we don't have time for that. <laughs> you know, I mean, the fact that they say that, right, to an elected official, right, who who 
I mean, at the time I was controlling the budget, <laughs> the state budget of law enforcement, right? And they're like, well, yeah, we don't have time for that. Like, you know, kind of piss off, right? I mean, number one, I was so offended because that's not how small town police departments operate. Um, and so I think the big city police department should almost be more well-funded. But it then created the awkward situation for me as an elected official where I had to call the principal of the local high school and say, hey, this is State Assemblyman Mike Gatto. Police might think that the killer went to your high school. Can you give me 10 years of yearbook so I could go through them? I mean, it was it was just crazy. It was crazy. And there's so many examples of that. And I know that other victims' families have many, many more. Was your father's house broken into? There was no signs of forced entry. So what does that tell you? Well, the police have a fascinating theory. Um, there was a woman coming home from karate the night that they think my dad was killed. She was driving home with her young son. She found this was the, the Silver Lake neighborhood is like a bowl. If you can picture a football stadium at the bottom is the lake. And then there's little streets that I call the aisles. And then there's other streets that that kind of stack up like a stadium. My father lived on one of the connector streets, three houses on the street, little tiny street. At one of the streets a little bit higher up, there was a car burglar breaking into cars. And uh, this woman was coming home from karate with her son. And she said, what are you doing? Like, stop breaking windows or something. And the guy fled. Um, her son thinks, and this is the key thing, he was a really young kid at the time. Her son thinks he saw a gun, okay? This was put out on social media. They pushed the boy to make a sketch, which we later learned was probably not that accurate. But for the longest time, this dominated the theory of who have, who might have killed my dad. The police's theory, and I want you to, to follow this with me, was this kid high on drugs was breaking into cars in right at the time that people come home from work in a quiet neighborhood where there's tons of traffic on a little tiny narrow street. And he's breaking into cars with a gun. He's packed with a gun, but instead of robbing people or trading the gun for drugs, he's breaking into cars. But then he's confronted by people. He doesn't shoot them. He runs away. OK, this is the police's theory. He runs because he's, he might be a neighborhood kid. He knows where there is a staircase that connects the streets. So he runs down this staircase. This is their theory. Because he's right handed, he then turns right. People who are being fled or chased tend to turn right if they're right handed, they tell me. Really? I'd never heard that. That's, that's, that's fascinating. OK. This is the police's theory. Then he sees my dad's street and he thinks it's an alley, very small street. He goes down there. At that moment, there was a tour helicopter going to the Hollywood sign. He thinks it's a police helicopter. At that moment, my dad was walking down to get something out of his trunk. He pressed his garage door. At that precise moment, the guy ducked in when he was closing it. That's why there's no force. I mean, right. It's like when people ask me about my dad's case, I say this was either the worst luck and these crazy, crazy, crazy circumstances that fit this narrative, or it's something much more. Wow. So why would you shoot a man at his, it be, it's not like he was found on the garage floor or in the living room floor or the kitchen floor. Why, why shoot him at his desk? I'll go a step further and something I neglected to mention. My father had three cars. One was in the driveway, two were in the garage. If this was some kid who didn't know my dad and he's running, he's trying to get away, he doesn't know if those three cars belong to the Ukrainian wrestling team, right? I mean, he doesn't know if this house has got 10 guys who share three cars, right? I mean, burglars don't typically go into inhabited dwellings. They just don't, right? And for this timeline to work out in that, you know, you would have had to have this guy right, you know, right when my dad is closing the garage door, he ducks in. And then he, to, for this timeline to work out, he would have had to sit in the garage for like an hour and just kind of chill out and not just press the button and run away and not steal anything from the garage. But at some point, walk inside an inhabited dwelling and go to the third floor. My dad had a third floor room and my dad would have had to not hear him enter his bedroom. And then the guy would have had to shoot him. And this is what's most important. And I, I apologize for getting graphic and it's hard for me to talk about this. My father bled to death. He didn't die from the wound. Uh, the, the police tell me that it entered his abdomen. It then went down into his leg and it severed an artery. Mm. That is a slow way to die. This person, again, assuming the dominant timeline that I was told for years, this person would have had to sit there and watch my dad bleed to death. 
and casually like ransack the room and do all these things. I have always had problems with this theory. I just don't believe it. There's just, there's just a part of me that says there's no way that all these things happen. The helicopter at the exact same time, my dad pushing the garage door button, somebody going into a house with three cars, you know, parked, going up to the third floor, my dad not hearing him, you know, all these, the gun accidentally going off, that's a theory. I just don't believe it. There's just something in the timeline that has always rubbed me the wrong way, something in the facts. So what do you think happened? I don't know. Um, part of the reason I wrote this book was because I, like a lot of the listeners, I, part of me likes a challenge. And also part of me believes that with logic and with good crime fighting processes, you can solve anything. And I have spent the last 10 years going through all the scenarios and listing all the clues and listing every piece of information we had. You know, I mean, I interviewed the people who saw the car burglar. I interviewed my dad's neighbors. I, I said, was his garage door open when you left? You know, this and that, like, what did you hear? I mean, I talked with anybody that I would, that, that would have any information and who would talk with me. I still am totally flummoxed by this case. I hope that I can crowdsource it. I hope that people will pick up the book and read it and say, oh my gosh, this doesn't make sense, or this makes sense, or this is my theory. And I also frankly hope that people in the neighborhood will come forward if they know anything. The crazy thing is the people who chased the car burglar, and remember the, the kid was the only person who could make a sketch and it wasn't that good. The, person who, the people who chased the car burglar, they saw a woman from the neighborhood. He passed a woman on the neighborhood when he was running down the stairs and she saw his face clearly, as clear as you can see mine, as clear as I can see yours. And she hasn't stepped forward and, and, and told the police what she knows or helped draw Scott. So there's still people out there who we think have information. And she may not even know who she saw. And yeah, that's a possibility but, that sometimes people in, don't know right. the little they know actually is worth something. That's true. That's a very good point. But, you know, Anna, this was front page news for, for months, years. It was on broadcast news nationwide. Um, it's hard for me to believe that she's not aware. I mean, this was the only murder in Silver Lake. She lived in the neighborhood if she was walking up these stairs. It's hard for me to believe that she's not aware that the case is out there and that her knowledge is relevant, but you never know. So this was November 13th of 2013. So there we may have We think it was been... November 12th. We think it was November 12th, but my was father th okay. was discovered November 13th. Okay, so think that he would have been killed on the 12th. Now, 2013, there would have been perhaps some surveillance cameras, but not like we have ring doorbells right now. Yeah, it's it's so hard to believe. You know, it's like we live in this modern world that changes so fast and it's so hard to put us back in time, like even 10 years ago. But that was one of the things that really frustrated the detectives. Silver Lake, for those of you who are not, your listeners who are not aware, Silver Lake is kind of a hippie neighborhood. It's a place where people today don't have too many doorbell cameras because that's kind of big brother, right? And it's amazing because, you know, if this kid literally ran on one street down another, walk street down another, down my dad's street, there's not one person who has any camera footage. And that is also very, very hard for us because if this had happened in many other neighborhoods, there would be footage. And, you know, we would have a better sense if this kid was related or if he was just a car thief who ran away. Did they retrieve any kind of evidence at the scene? They did. The police have been public about it at press conferences. Um, there were unknown prints. We don't know if those unknown prints were the killers, but there were several unknown prints in my dad's house. Uh, was that promising? Yes and no. My dad was, I won't say a pack rat, but he definitely liked to collect. I'll put it that way. So he bought stuff at garage sales. He bought stuff at thrift stores. He loved buying things, right? And so there's unknown prints on a lot of belongings, but we don't know if that's from the person, you know, who sold it to the thrift store or if it was the killers. Uh, secondly, the police have indicated to me and they've also, they've also uh, you know, indicated to the media and at press conferences that there's DNA. There's DNA that they think belongs to the killer. Can't be sure, but they believe that there is DNA that belongs to the killer. 
And has everything from that crime scene still been, is it still preserved, whatever this DNA and where that DNA, because I don't know what the item is, uh, you know, n- nor do we need to necessarily reveal that even if you know, but if there is DNA and it's on either his body or a piece of clothing or something of his, presumably all of this is preserved? Yeah, everything's been preserved as far as I know, you know, but that's that's sometimes that's the hard thing, right, is getting specific answers and getting reassurance. I know it's very hard for any um, family of crime victims. It's been hard for me, too. Oh, it is. The system is not easy and it is not kind on the survivors um, and on the victims' families. It's just it's a horrific system. I'm I, I, I guess I, I, I'll ask you that only because we're there now. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is if what happened to you has, I mean, obviously it's a life-changing event, but has it changed how you view the criminal justice system and perhaps any positions or thoughts um, that you had or agendas that you had because of what you have experienced? Absolutely. I mean, Anna, there's no way that going through something like this can't change you. I was cautioned, you know, very early on. There's a saying in the Capitol that anecdotes make bad law. What they mean by that is if you're going to pass a law, you should base it on data. Personal experiences are not always the best guide. But for something like this, it's very, very hard for it not to shape you. I have become an outspoken critic of the efforts to get rid of bail. I think that's crazy. Personally, I think I agree with you. (laughs) Okay, I mean, I I just think it's it's wrongheaded and it's going to lead to more people being victimized. And um, and I've also, you know, you also come to realize that the criminal justice system is vast. It's imperfect. It's complicated. Things are very hard on victims. Um, You know, I attend a lot of victims marches and I mean, uh, you know, I, I befriended a lot of other people who have gone through something like this and I see what they're going through. And again, I I am so fortunate that I have a platform. I'm fortunate to be talking with you today. These other families don't have that. And you know, over 50% of murders go unsolved. And that number is far too high, far too high. It's amazing how many people get away with murder. I, Mike, I, you know, when I went into true crime investigating and, um, you know, as a street reporter, because um, y- you cover crime every day, but this is a different kind of crime. And it wasn't until I started traveling the country that I realized how many people get away with murder every day. Yeah. It is getting the- harder because of digital forensic evidence, but I can't, I cannot believe how many people but get away with murder. That's what I was going to say, which is a mind blowing statistic. Since the advent of DNA technology, the number of people getting away with murders has actually risen. And I believe from my experience and for what it's worth, that that is because to some degree, DNA has made police, well, it's changed the nature of a detective. Detectives are now expected to do the CSI stuff and everything like that. And that's bad and good. People get impatient, but it also, I think, makes certain detectives lazy. They say, well, we're going to wait till there's a match. Well, you know, (laughs) like, you know, in, in my dad's case, what if the physical evidence turns out to just be from somebody that went to the same thrift store, right? What if it's not relevant? Uh, you know, I think that good old fashioned gumshoe work of talking with all the neighbors and talking with all my dad's friends, all that, that wasn't really done in my dad's case. And to me, that means that it wasn't done in many other people's cases as well. This is really troubling, you know, this, this, <sighs> This, you have this wonderful man. I mean, I just love, you know, when you say gives everyone a tomato, I can just completely (laughs) picture this man (laughs) with his fabulous tomato plants. Yep. (laughs) Everyone's, we all have one of those in our lives, right? (laughs) And they're, and they're super special. What I'm trying to figure out here is, um, how is it possible that we know so little about what happened to your father? I agree. I mean, How is that possible? Which uh, department or division has been responsible for your father's investigation here at LAPD? Yeah, so it's LAPD's most elite unit. It's the robbery homicide unit. And um, the current team working on it is fantastic. Um, they, uh, there's a new team that started, I want to say, about 2020, 2019. They're fantastic. Interesting. So it's that unit as opposed to the local department Precisely. that would cover Silver Lake. 
Precisely, and it's not cold cases either. You know, um, there's a new, there's a different cold case unit, and it's not with them either. So it's still an active case, but it's just cold. I mean, that's that's how they phrase it to me. Now you received there been tips, yes. and then um, I, I actually I was watching your interview that you did with um, um, a colleague of mine, Conan Nolan. He and I used to work right. together at Channel Four, and he had you on. He he does a Sunday show, Sunday morning show, and you were talking about how some people called in these absolutely fake tips, some of which you took so seriously that you even alerted the police to. Can you share that with us? Yeah, so so this next bit is something that has been very hard on me. And I know it's, you know, I there's a part of it that yes, probably happened because I was in a high profile position, right? When one is in politics, you tend to draw out all the crazies. But I also believe that for the average murder victims family who might live in a small town they probably have their share of things like that too people know how to reach them people probably share their theories their axes to grind everything like that and i have had so many crazy theories shared with me but remember people don't come out with the crazy as i said in my book they don't lead with the crazy so when i was in office there was a lady who called me and she said you know the sketch that's been publicized the the person that the police believe is a person of interest in your father's killing is outside my house right now. And uh, you got to come get him. You got to come get him. So I drove over there, you know, risking my life 70 miles an hour. Um, I called the police. They sent cars. Uh, we get there, and I'm making a very long story very short. We found out that this was just a homeless guy that she wanted away from her house. Had nothing to do with my dad's case. Didn't even really look like the guy. She just... You know, and I think she kind of admitted this at, at some point that it was just really a homeless guy that she just wanted some attention for. And she, she wanted used, the cops to respond to her yeah, homeless complaint. Exactly. She she had no problem using me, getting my hopes up. And I wish I could say that that was the first time that that happened, but it's not. Things like that have happened many times. And that type of thing really toys with your emotions. And I know that I'm not the only one. Like I said, if you're in a small town, there's probably people who say, oh, that was Billy Bob and they've got an ax to grind with Billy Bob, right? But this type of thing was really tough on me. And, um, but you know, what I've always said to the police is, here's the theory. <laughs> I don't think it's valid, but I'm passing it along to you anyway. You know, explore everything. I don't want you to leave anything untouched. Explore everything you can. When something like this happens, Obviously, investigators are asking what was going on, not only in the victim's life, but what was going on in the family? Were there any issues going on in the family? Um, were there any disputes going on in the family? And, and based on some published reports, there was something going on in your family uh, involving, I guess, um, perhaps a changing of his will, uh, perhaps removing one of the daughters, and then if there was a contesting of all this, did that lead anywhere? Did that lead in investigators anywhere? I don't know if it led investigators anywhere, but it certainly led to a lot of heartbreak and difficulty for my family. Um, you know, every family has its challenges and my family is no different. Um, so I have two sisters and uh, they were not, I guess the word would be getting along that great before my dad was killed. They had, the way it was presented to me at least, was they had some sort of dispute over real estate. I don't know how big or small it was, but that made things very tense already. It made things very, very, very tense when my father was killed because I felt as the middle child like I was thrust into this thing between them. Um, at some point, I got very frustrated myself at the continued bickering. I thought that my father's estate was pretty simple, that it should be administered fairly. It is my personal belief, and I have, you know, I think pretty, pretty good, um, you know, evidence of this, that, yeah, my dad was considering changing his will. He was very much into this thing that is, you know, I guess people call it generation skipping. He wanted to not take care of the people who were, you know, in their 30s and 40s. And at the time, he wanted to take care of his grandkids. And, you know, and I think he was considering doing that very strongly. Um, 
you know, the, the, the challenge is sifting through all this. Like I said, when you have the midst of a murder investigation and you're doing your best to help the police and to be a resource, and then you've got all this other distractions. And it's, you know, again, I know I'm not the only family went through it, but it, it, it certainly made my dad's case that much harder. So where are you now in life, Mike? Like what your your 10 years without any really good answers or updates, it's it's can we even say that in these 10 years you've gotten a really good solid lead or there's been a twist or something that's been revealed? You know, there, there haven't been any uh, really solid leads. And what, what has blown me away Anna, has been that um, even 10 years in, I continue to learn new things. Um, one of the things that I talk about in my book was how uh, there was a neighbor of my dad's who we didn't even meet until I hired a private detective. And she said, the police's timeline is all wrong. I heard a gunshot at 6.30. They're saying 7.30. I heard it at 6.30. I mean, that changes everything, right? Uh, but again, you know, I gave that to the police. They kind of poo-pooed it. They said, nah, you know, could have been a firecracker, blah, blah, blah. You know, and that um, you have to trust them to some degree, but you also have to keep pushing. Uh, just last year, I learned that my dad more than likely fought back uh, for the last 10 years, we always assumed that he had been caught unaware or something like that. But uh, one of the detectives told me that my dad likely fought back. And that's that's also telling because that that makes you think that, you know, he wasn't necessarily surprised and that this might have been somebody who he thought he could fight with. Right. I mean, it, maybe that means that the suspect wasn't 6'2", 220. Right. So so, I mean, it's amazing that I've, I'm still learning so much 10 years into it. I have tried to do my best to not let this define me. But at the same time, Anna, you know, it has shaped my life. Um, I told you about how to approach my policymaking. It is one of the reasons, not everything, but it's one of the reasons I put my political career on hold. Um, I, part of it was having a third child, but part of it is this lack of closure and how much time it takes and having so many questions about my dad's case. And then the third, the third thing is it has made me way more sensitive to victims out there. I always was. I was always, you know, on the conservative side of things from a law enforcement perspective as a Democrat. But this has made me, you know, for whatever reason, I feel like I need to speak up for all the other people who are waiting for answers. Um, there's one thing, you know, because of your perspective now, and you say you're you know, you've really gone back and you're analyzing just even policy wise where your positions are. Um, there's something here in California, which was um, Prop 47. And, um, you know, your comment about an anecdote does not make a law. You know, the thing with the propositions in California is that I never I absolutely never trust any propositions in the state of California. <laughs> smart woman, smart woman. <laughs> there isn't a proposition out there, I think, that can, because I always think something's wrong with this. Um, this is funded by something, the underbelly. I'm okay. constantly suspicious of propositions. and But this is a, one of those propositions that I think, you know, I think maybe looking back may or may not impact things going forward or, or from your father's uh, murder. So what Prop 47 did, in the simplest of terms, and Mike, please correct me if this is not correct, but it downgraded certain crimes from felonies to misdemeanors, things like drug and property crimes that maybe were considered felonies have been dropped down to misdemeanors. The perhaps unintended consequence of that, let's say whether you agree or disagree with that, is that when you change the classification of a certain crime, it indicates whether... DNA will be collected and submitted to the criminal database. These criminal databases that we have, you know, we have one, we have one in the state of California, and then there's the, you know, there are all these databases that holds the DNA of um, convicted criminals. And so if DNA of these lower offenses is not being included in the database and the theory for your father's murder. One possible theory is that maybe it was just someone who was breaking into cars and breaking into homes, which would be the lower level offense, that you may never find that person because maybe their DNA is not in the system. 
you are a savvy reporter. Most people talk about Prop 47's connection to homelessness and retail theft, but very few talk about the connection. Well, there's that too, but. <laughs> yeah, but, but this is so important. Uh, we took a, well, we, the, the people who voted for this, I did not, I actually spoke out against it uh, while it was still being passed, even that, with no connection to my dad's case, obviously. Um, I have been, have learned, you know, not only did we take a whole bunch of, you know, fairly serious crimes um, and make them into misdemeanors, which in big counties means people don't even spend a day in jail. But we have, as you noted, we have taken away the ability for law enforcement to swab these people for DNA. And you think about not just the murders that would be solved, but the rapes, uh, the other crimes where physical evidence is usually present. We have just destroyed with Prop 47 the ability for police to solve probably tens of thousands of crimes. And this is one of those things where, as you said, you know, when there is a proposition that comes out there, I beg voters now. I say, you know what, if you don't understand it, if you haven't thought through the unintended consequences, and if you don't know who's backing it, just vote no. I mean, just just vote no, because the commercials are very slick and they're designed to get you to pass it. And I'm kind of sad that the voters of California got fooled. I think everybody now has realized that Prop 47 has been an absolute disaster. It's the unintended consequences. You know, you try and it's like when you're trying to fix a dam, right? You, you fix this hole and then, oh, my goodness, now it puts pressure in this area and we didn't see this one coming. Um, it's it's a very... Oh, it's so challenging. It is so challenging. And especially when, you know, you are like so many others, you are a family looking for answers. And, and I mean, where are they going to come from other than someone who saw something or heard something that maybe this will jog their memory? Oh, my goodness. What in your book, I mean, it had to have been a very difficult book to write, especially if it's about your father's murder. Yeah, you know, in a weird way, it was it was certainly very difficult. Sharing a lot of these details was very painful, but in a weird way, it was also cathartic. It was also, you know, it felt, I really do believe, I mean, I know that your audience, for example, a lot of the people who, who uh, believe in the ability of people um, out there to help solve true crimes. I believe that by sharing some of these details, you know, there there might be a consensus that emerges. There might be minds that are far more brilliant than me who will say, you know, what about this angle? What about this angle? And that it could spark some change. My dad's case, maybe in other cases. Um, so, you know, it was hard for me to write this book, but I feel like I had to do it. I mean, um, you know, I would not be my father's son if I didn't do everything I could to make sure that his crime is solved. And so that's what my book is about. And given the the tensions around his will and then the the civil actions afterwards and and all of that, did how did this book impact all that was going on with your siblings and all that stress? Well, I mean, I guess that, that that some of that has remained to be seen, you know, but but I mean, look, I tried to be as fair as possible in the book. I presented evidence as I've got it. I only presented hard evidence. You know, this is something that's been well researched. This is the source. This is, you know, how it's documented. This is who told me. All of those things were very and there's a lot in the book that I tried not to put out there. There's certain details of my father's case, very few, certain details of my father's case that the police have asked me not to share. Um, just about everything else they have said publicly at some point. Um, but I believe that by laying it out, it will do two things. Um, it'll give the people out there who you know just believe that the whole criminal justice system needs to be reformed for the criminals. It'll give them the window, raw emotion and all, of what it's like to be the family victim of uh, the family of a murder victim. Um, Cause I outlined it. The whole book is chronological. It is on this day. I learned this. And on this day, I had this false start. And on this day, I, I did this. And, on, you know, and I think just seeing what people go through should hopefully maybe help some of those people change their positions a little bit. And then for the people out there who are super sleuths, who like solving crimes, who like, you know, the challenge of a mystery, maybe they'll have some idea. And, you know, hopefully all of this, you know, contributes to the discussion on these very important issues. Just 
personally for myself, I, I hope that if we see any kind of criminal justice reform, my wish is that the reform is for the victims and their families. Yes. I realize many things can be fixed, need to be fixed. I get that. But I really feel that what is truly needed is more support for the survivors and the victims of crime. Because I think Absolutely. that is where our criminal justice system fails. Absolutely. I mean, it is every aspect of the criminal justice system. I told a story in my book about how I attended a, um, a, a march for crime victims um, that was in South Los Angeles. And this was right after COVID had ended. And we marched for miles to try to bring attention to other victims' families. Um, and this woman came up to me, her son had been shot in her front yard. He died in her arms and she was so wounded. I mean, Anna, she was so wounded. And she said to me, she said, you know, everybody in the neighborhood knows who killed my son and we can't get the police to go talk to them. And I just, you know, you, you read these stories, right? You read about the grim sleeper and you read about these cases that stretched 10 years, 20 years, right? And it, it's amazing. I mean, you know, if there are aspects of my case where I was, you know, the chairman of appropriations for the state of, state, state of California, if there's aspects of my case that were, you know, very hard and, and not adequately followed up on, you know that's happening with other people. And that breaks my heart because I've met all those people. And there's a lot of cases out there where there could be more attention paid, but also, like you said, legal changes, things that benefit the people who are just waiting for answers. Yeah. They are the victims here without question. Mike, it's um, it's 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 been a pleasure, though, a sorrowful one um, Thank you. to speak with you uh, again. I'm sorry for your loss. Mike, tell us uh, the name of your book again, where you can get it and also where people can either find you or follow you if um, something's going on. Sure. So um, I try to be very accessible. Folks can find me on Twitter at Mike Gatto. They can send me a direct message if they have any information about my dad's case. Uh, they can also write me at campaign at mikegatto.com. It's an old email address, I apologize, but it does come directly to me. Um, the book I wrote is called Noir by Necessity, How My Father's Killing Took Me to Dark Places. And it's available on Amazon. And um, I hope it sparks a good conversation. I hope you get answers, Mike. Thank you so much, Anna. I hope you get answers. Um, this has been a special edition of True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.